Hi, everybody. Welcome to Attack with Larry C. I'm your host, Larry Christensen. Now, I intended to begin Larry's uh, Attacking Handbook series today with this episode, but because of the passing of, of the late, great Victor Korchnoi, Le Victor Levo Levovich Korchnoi, who died June 6, 2016, in Switzerland, uh, I will. I'd like to d devote this um, this show to this epic, legendary, great player, one of the all-time greats. There's no doubt about it. So we're going to and a fine attacking player in all phases of the game. Um, so we're going to just devote the show to Victor Korchnoi. He needs no really no introduction. He was born in what was then Leningrad, Soviet Union. Um, and uh, survived the Leningrad siege or the early stages of it and had a uh, rough beginning and uh, became known. He uh, on, and other prominent young uh, Leningrad uh, players such as Boris Spassky rose, to, uh, rose up through the ranks and Korchnoi started competing in, as a youth in the uh, USSR championships and did very well, of course, um, and just rose up through the ranks up until the 60s when he really became a dominant player. He, along with Spassky, Fisher, Tall, uh, Petrosian, those were the big names of chess. Maybe also Rob, uh, Bent Larson at the time, Lejos Portish also, uh, but they were the big names of the 1960s. And Korchnoi stayed a great player, very pro strong player, way up until the 2000s. Uh, I think his, he in his mid-70s, he was in the top um, 75 or top 50 in the world, and deservedly so. Very tough customer up until he was around 80. Um, and... Uh, his peak would be around 1975, after he defected from the Soviet Union in 76. Um, Korchnoi's talent, this, this was in his, he was in his 40s by then, mid-40s, when he defected in 1976 to Holland, and later he ends up in um, Switzerland. He played for Swiss, the Swiss uh, in the starting 1978, I believe. Um, but he defected in Holland in 1976. But that's when his talent really uh, completely uh, exploded. I mean, in, in full view of everybody, he was just a dom totally dominant player uh, in the, in the, on the European circuit. And including epic match with, uh, with matches with Pogajewski crushed him, uh, defeated Spassky in a hard-fought match uh, in 1977 to earn the right to play Karpov and the their big match in Baguio, and uh, which in a very very controversial, very bitterly fought contest, Karpov managed to win six wins to five. Um, of course, uh, Korchnoi played all the, all the top great players, more than held his own against most of them. Um, Mikhail Tall was a, had a nightmare facing off, the great Mikhail Tall had a complete nightmare facing off against Korchnoi, um, and Korchnoi had a great record against many other stars. Now, this show is going to be sort of a small compilation of Korchnoi's greatest hits, I'm even throwing one, one of my losses to him because um, he's just a highly respected player. Okay, and I'll talk, there's a little anecdote in, in connection with uh, my law. Uh, well, I'll talk about it later. Okay, let's start off. Here's a great example by Korchnoi of counterattack and brilliant combinative play. He could, noted for his tough, tenacious defense, great endgame skill, positional mastery, but Korchnoi could combine with the best of them. So here's a game against a uh, middle-ranked player of the, of the time. And it's Nimzo Indian, Korchnoi, 
could play Grunfeld, um, Nimzo. He later joined to play the Queen's Indian, uh, like a real expert. Uh, he was a well, he was just very versatile player, white and black. So here he's facing off against the sameish Nimzo, and he sets up a blockade as you're supposed to do. Cher Cherupkov is his opponent. Alexander Cherupkov, Leningrad, 1959. Okay, so he's trying to go all out to set up this big offensive. Korchnoi kicks and tries to blockade now. And there is the full blockade of F4 now has been shut down. As a matter of fact, actually, Cherp uh, Cherupkov could have considered F4, the violent reaction F4, um, and that would have been perfectly good compensation if he had ventured that. But uh, instead, he played the passive F3. You don't want to go passive against these guys. Okay, can't, now Korchnoi quickly dominates the position. Um... And he works on both sides of the board, utilizing pressure against C4. And here, Cherupkov tries to get something going, and he, wisely so. He's got to do something before Black uh, installs a full blockade and takes over the C4 pawn. Korchnoi develops and pins. Very classical player. Even though he has these knights on the rim, they're doing a lot there. Okay, this was, I think that was a mistake by Cherupkov, and now he should have played F takes E5 and pays a heavy price soon. Okay, so here that lets the queen come over to G6. King, Black's king is lifted. That enables rook H8 later. And now we see the execution phase. And this is a sweet one. So he's backing up. Uh, rook a2 might have been a, a possibility here, but um, Black still has a great position. And now we get one hammer blow after another, starting with Bishop h3 attacking the rook. Rook f2. Black to move and win. Starting off with knight takes c4. Diverting the bishop, all forced. If he doesn't take the knight, he's a pawn down with a rotten game. Centralized queen. Now, that's one very common aspect. We'll see in um, subsequent examples, too. Korchnoi loved his centralized queens. Game after game after game. And here it just dominates the board. Pins the knight. It hits the bishop. Influences the king area. Let's see what happens. So one thunderbolt now after another. Bang. Knight takes g3. Threading mate. And of course, the knight on e2 is pinned, so he must take the pawn. And now one more little shot to wind things up. Bishop h1. Threading mate two ways. If rook takes f1, we get quick mate. Rook h1 check. King f2. Rook check here and mate. Cherupkov played king takes f1 and suffered a grievous material loss after rook h1 check. All, the investment now pays off with big interest. And to add insult to injury, of course, white's pin, pinned up. No play, just a hopeless lot position. Here, Cherupkov resigned. One of a ni nice combo among literally hundreds to choose from. Okay, our next encounter is from a uh, Grunfeld played against uh, Svetozar Gligorich, top Yugoslav Serbian player for many, many years. Of course, a another great player. And uh, here's a Gligorich playing the Grunfeld defense, and here it didn't work out too well for him. His uh, position is, well, to say the least, he's a pawn down with a crummy position. But uh, Gligorich, uh, Korchnoi here ends the game and very nice fashion. How to win a how to win a one game. Here we go. So uh, 
Gligerich tries knight a5, disrupts some trouble with the knight. He's got some forking opportunities here. Uh, watch how uh, Korchnoi finishes this one up. He plays d6. Who cares about that rook? Takes. Okay, d7. Okay, so, uh, so you get one of these rooks back, right? No, he wants bigger game here. The knight goes wandering back to a5, of course. Any of the rooks move, he's going to be a piece down. So he's got to save his knight. There it goes, knight a5. Hey, let's uh, let's attack that knight now. Again, threading takes and just winning up being a piece up. Okay, Gligor says, well, I'll fight back by with knight b3. Uh, it's, it's a little dangerous out there, but of course, I now ends a nice little flare uh, with queen c6. Offering the queen, hitting both rooks simultaneously, and it's clear that uh, Black has to resign here. Nice game, nice little finish. Uh, here's another one. This is a, one of his better. Com this is a very sophisticated combo. This was played in the Murano 1981 World Championship match between uh, Korchnoi and uh, Karpov. Of course. Uh, Karpov uh, won that match very decisively. Korchnoi was half a little bit, not quite uh, at the level he was playing around 1977 to 1980. He was just on fire. But uh, I think that this was the beginning of a slow decline in his playing strength, detectable at the, around this stage. Still very formidable, but... Um, he had lost a half a step. Okay, but here's a sign he could still bring out the A game. Okay, Korchnoi, a uh, big-time fan of queenside openings in his, in his mid to later years. And real expert in the queen's game to decline. Many ideas are, uh, and novelties are uh, attributed to Korchnoi. And of course, I love this type of uh, sharp, um, combative offer. So a bishop, we've talked about this line before, bishop g6, white plays h4. Uh, I'll just show you the cheap trap. h4 if takes, white plays queen b3 hitting the pawn. b6, rook takes bishop, queen takes, knight takes d5, and black gets crushed. Okay, so the point of this, this is the idea of Bovenik from way back uh, in the early 60s, I think. And the idea is just to seize some space, uh, keep Black's king side under pressure, threat of a pawn storm, and leave any castle short. So just sort of hanging over uh, Black's head. And White's king often goes to G2, walks over, after getting his minor pieces out. So here they come, and Black's king is, you know, feels a little nervous with this formation. So Karpov reacts vigorously, and there's that little king walk to g2. Korchnoi's happy. Time after you, will, we'll see a couple other examples where he has a lifted king, uh, which we just saw in that Cherubkov example. King on g2, paying off in a big way. King on g7 in that case. Okay, solid development. And now the action begins. So black has an isolated queen pawn, but a very uh, well-developed position. Looks healthy. Korchnoi now plays to uh, menace the bishop. He's got working on this square and also the blockade of the d5 pawn. There it goes, uh, putting pressure on black's queen side. Of course, now the a7 pawn is threatened, so he takes, trades rooks, and now pawn takes. This was this may have come as a surprise to uh, Karpov. Pawn takes, now he's got, well, he's got, still has his ideas on a7, but also knight c7. Looks like a rather minor threat. Karpov and answers in kind here. Now, if knight takes a7, 
black can just simply play rook a8 if knight b5, rook takes a2, and he recovers his pawn with an active game, equal game, roughly. Actually, I would take white here, too, queen b3, with a, some initiative. Fortunately, I played knight c7, and black's supposedly bl bad bishop is the target. Here's now, Korchnoi's point is, after rook c8, if queen takes, he'd prefer to play queen takes, but then bishop f5 skewers that rook on c8. So he has to play f e, and that's a big target. So white has emerged uh, with a solid edge in the middle game. Bishops are, are eagerly looking forward to um, harassing the king, also um, perhaps harassing the e6 pawn. Okay, more forceful play. Karpov happily, uh, well, he'd be thrilled if Korchnoi got rid of his bishop. And Black's uh, centralized. He's attacking a2, gets his pawn back with a good game. Korchnoi doesn't want that, so he now brings his queen out, ties Black down to e6. The queen's hovering around the king's side as well. So he's... Uh, of course, he wouldn't play something uh, as naive as bishop takes e4. Karpov does his best to stir up some trouble. And now the fun begins. Here's f3, taking out that knight. Now, if black plays, let's say, bishop d6 here, white will kick the bishop on a5, b4, driving it to a5, and then we can get bishop takes, queen takes, queen h5, threatening mate, and if g6, of course, bishop takes g6 is absolutely crushing. So a3 would be a powerful uh, answer to uh, knight d6. Karpov was relying on queen f7 to save himself. So f takes e4, queen takes f4. Queen takes e6 check would be idiotic, to say the least. And black's doing all the attacking there. And queen takes f4, rook takes, doesn't offer enough serious uh, pressure for black to uh, be too concerned. So he went for rather intricate little continuation, bishop e5. Okay, knight's under attack, but what about knight takes g5? Well, queen takes, queen takes f3, check, king h2. Looks good at first sight, but uh, now white's threatening mate on g7, and uh, queen takes d3, we get mate. And if black plays g6, white consolidates to victory with queen g3. So he plays the active move. Oh, what about knight d6? Of course, now he's after a3, the bishop's overloaded. So black played knight d2, hitting f3. Looks like some serious counterplay. Korchnoi seen a little further. a3. Now, bishop a5. White has a number of good moves. b4, but even better, is bishop d6. And black's position really implodes. You have rook d8, rook takes e6, and white's all over him. So Karpov tries knight takes f3. The point being now, if white plays a takes b3, black has knight e1 check at his disposal. Rook takes e1, queen f2 check. King h1. Queen takes e1 check, queen g1, and if anybody's better here, it's uh, black on account of white's exposed king. Nice bishops, but uh, they, can, they can't uh, make up for the exposure of white's king. Okay, so now Korchnoi continues g6. I should say bishop g3 here is another good move. g6. And now he consolidates bishop g3, takes away... Knight h4 check and knight e1 check. And black is... Black's position, he's totally over, overextended. 
but he fights on. Bishop e7. Here it is. Rook f2. Pin and win. Still a little bit of work. Check. Takes. And the real point of this is the black knight is out on a limb on d3. Takes. Forced. Now the knight's dominated. The bishop and the queen dominate that poor knight. Queen takes b d5. That knight's not getting out alive. Okay, so now b5, white plays queen a8 check, rook f8, queen takes a6 with an easy mop-up job. So he tried bishop f6, but now after bishop d6, that paralyzes black. That rook on f7 is now very hard to shake that pin. So just a few looks. I'm sure Korsnoy was, as usual, was in severe time pressure. This is the days before increment. Queen b3. Now he comes back. What's the purpose of that? So now um, white threatens queen e8 check. Must try to meet the threat. And now he picks off the knight. Nice little effort. Black resign. After this move. Okay, another good one. Here's another, another nice combo. At my expense, this was played in uh, Mar uh, Regio 1987-88. And uh, always, uh, I played Korsnoy uh, a number of times. Actually, let me talk about, uh, can, Korsnoy had a, a reputation being somewhat cantankerous, which he was, uh, not exactly the Mr. Nice Guy. After, especially after he lost a game, he was noted for sweeping the, t the pieces off the board. And uh, he just could sometimes he just could not restrain himself. Um, he was very intense. He, he just lived, he really lived to play chess. And um, that's why he was a great player, seriously. He, that intensity carried over in, on, on, totally onto the game. So he just lived or died with each move. So in 19, but uh, I can say that also, in, he, to his credit, there's some great incidents regarding his sportsmanship. Um, and one of them the, that really impressed me was in, in an encounter in 1983. I played in Pasadena, U.S. Open with the Victor. Victor was playing in that tournament um, as a, they had canceled the uh, every eagerly anticipated Korchnoi Kasparov match set to be in, held in Pasadena, and of course, uh, that match never happened. It was held later um, in, uh, in London, makeup match. But in 83, the, uh, the Soviets were boycotting, for whatever reason, the match in Pasadena with, uh, with Korchnoi and Kasparov, and uh, so Korchnoi was playing in the U.S. Open. And he was near the top of his game. Uh, I was also playing in the tournament. I just won the U.S. Championship. I was also working on a chess newspaper at the time called Players Chess News. And uh, I was the editor and writing. Finishing up uh, when I played Korsnoy that morning, I was finish, finishing up the newspaper, which I did, and uh, churning out 12 pages of text. Um and uh, sure enough, uh, one of the, this is the thing, type of thing only absent-minded chess players do. Um, pre I prepared for Korchnoi a bit, got some ideas together, and I was going to drive down to the Huntington Sheraton Hotel for the for the game. Now, this is a big game. Some Hollywood people were showing up. I think Peter Falk and uh, William Wyndham and some others were going to spectate. So... Uh, and I'm playing Korchnoi. I have the white pieces. And uh, so I'm, here's, and now we get to the crunch time. I, I draw, so the, my car, or the car I was relying on, um, turns out it had about two ounces of gasoline in that car. This is a day I'm big game against Korchnoi. And uh, so 
I think my brother was driving me. In fact, I know he was. And I, so we ran out of gas just shortly driving as on our way to the gas station. Now, And I asked him, hey, do you have any cash on you? No. And I checked my wallet. I, it was empty as well. I did have an ATM card. Um, around in that old jalopy uh, he drove uh, was a, about 59 cents in pennies and nickels that we scrounged up. I gave him that 59 cents. Got a, He got managed to get half a gallon of gas. And... Um, I managed to get within three miles on the Huntington Sheraton when that that uh, car finally ran out from that even after the refill, the 59 cents worth that ran out. Of course, I'm panicking. I'm looking at my watch, if I carried a watch in those days. This is August of 1983. Rarely rains, but if it does rain in California, August is a rainy period, of, of course, uh, as luck would have it, it starts raining as I'm running panic-stricken to the Huntington Sheraton to play Korchnoi, thinking, oh, you know, big. If I'm spotting him 45 minutes or something. And uh, I managed to get there running half the way, soaked, disheveled, uh, and there's Korchnoi. Not, he didn't start my clock. And something I was very impressed with. I mean, that was, I think he just sympathized with it. We got on with the game, had a great game, and uh, I'll never, you know, it's a nice gesture from Korchnoi in a big game. And, and uh, it was a game worth uh, recounting. Anyway, so he, and he had some other, uh, other episodes similar to that, quiet little gestures. He would help people uh, on the side, go over, and he would, spend hours going over games. Let's say uh, your master, I am, he would hang out in the Skittles room and then happily analyze and uh, learn and teach people, basically. So, um, anyway, this is a game I played against, Mar this is from, against um, Victor in 1987-88. And here I am playing the white side of a Grunfeld attack. Of course, I had quite a Grunfeld uh, expert, and this was a, a line that later became big news in the 2000s. Okay, so the idea is here: White is sacrificed to Rook to go, or the exchange at the moment to go after Black's King, and which is not well defended. So, of course, I sack again. This is sound. And I retreat the bishop. This is also an, a thought. And now I believe they play bishop c2 here is uh, considered the main line. But uh, the idea being bishop takes c2, rook takes c2, queen d1, followed by f4. Wild, crazy line. But uh, Victor instead played queen a5. And I played queen d4. Good, smart move. Rook c4. Again, bishop c2 is possible. Queen f2. So I managed to get that queen closer to the black king. He sacks. Good move. And now it comes deep. That stops queen g3 check. Now I uh, won. You know, you have to be ruthless when you're attacking and when you have the, the initiative. Now white has... Um, Two pawns for a piece, but Black's King is, is has some headaches, and White has a nice wedge of pawns here. I should have played D6 here, and I think they've analyzed that. Uh, that's leads to an edge for White, but I hesitated. You don't hesitate against Black Sikorchnoi with H3. Little too, over concerned about King safety when I should have been more concerned with going after him with d6. Korchnoi advances the queen to d3 where it uh, ties me down to the rook on f1. Also black is attacking the all-important pawn on e4. And now, fatal mistake, queen f5, um, 
looks good at first sight, but uh, has a big flaw. I should have played rookie one, planning a rook lift. That would have, I think, uh, led to a draw. Thanks to these uh, perpetual check, isn't setting and threat against a7. That would have led to a roughly equal game, but instead I blundered here with queen f5. Nice refutation here from Korchnoi, rook c8. Now my only chance was to try rook f3, queen d1 check, rook f1. That was, that's white's only hope. But, uh, which I think black has still got the edge. But he, instead I played this lemon. I should have played that a few moves earlier. And Kortznoy solves this one rather elegantly. Queen takes. Bishop f4, take, finally taking down that horrible knight. Kortznoy plays bishop e8, covering g6. Rook b1, planning very optimistically planning rook b1, a rook lift, which I should have done a few moves ago. And here black wins with queen d3, rook b3, get rid of that rook. Oops. And my queen is trapped. I resigned. Good defender, that court's noy. Okay, now, uh, next game. Is uh, now Arthur Yusupov is was involved in a very important incident in Korchnoi's career. This was um, Lone Pine 1981, when there was this big block of the Soviet uh, boycott of Korchnoi and that was ongoing for many years after he defected in '76. Uh, he was persona non grata by the USSR Chess Federation, and this was this game between Korchnoi and Yusupov was uh, first time that blockade was broken. And I was a witness to it. Lone Pine 81, I was there to watch it. And um, so a lot of that, there was a lot of anticipation would Yusupov shake Korchnoi's hand in, uh, and would even play. But uh, to his eternal credit, Yusupov, of course, did play. And that I don't know what repercussions that had for him. It couldn't have been good, but uh, that was a big moment. And um, uh, anyway, that they had a splendid game. And let's get right to it. This was Lone Pine eighty one. Okay, this is a uh, Slav semi Slav. Black is a white has the bishop pair. Black is a really solid, very solid position. Of course, my really an expert in this type of formation, and he gets it going now with b4. Well, it'll soon be b4. A little maneuvering, and he gets it going with b4. That's like a minority attack. Ultimately, he wants to open the position for his bishops. Maybe create a little target on the queen side. Eventual target. And black plays to free himself. That was well considered by Korchnoi. Now the point is, if black plays knight takes b4, queen b3, if knight a6, white does not play bishop takes a6, he instead goes for the jugular with knight e4, threatening knight d6. If then rook c d8, to meet that threat, white starts attacking with f4. Knight has nowhere to go except for the dismal d7 square. And after knight d6, hitting f7, the rook, and b7, black's game quickly collapses. <clears throat> so uh, Yusupov plays to uh, return the pawn. And here, Korchnoi, quite satisfied. He's got a wonderfully centralized, powerful queen. Bishop pair still looks like a lot of work to win this one against a tough defender like Yusupov. Okay, and black offers to trade rooks. Nope, he does not want to trade rooks. He plays rook d1, taking control of the d file. Still, black has 
no weaknesses to, to speak of in a solid looking position. But those bishop, that bishop pair, always a major factor. Another nice move. Little back step, meeting the idea of rook d8, of course. The queen remains centralized. Just sort of dominates the board from e4. Okay, so here Yusupov playing to pl drop into c4 and shut down the bishop. He goes from Korchnoi, very flexible, goes back to d5 where it puts pressure on f7. And uh, also he's, he's thinking of a4 to create a weakness. So here he's little cat and mouse, rook d8's on the agenda. And here black wants to improve his king position with king g7. So if uh, a, b, black had planned uh, rook d8 there. Queen e4, rook takes, bishop takes a, b, and white's a little better, but nothing out of the ordinary. So Korchnoi backs it up a little. Knight c4, and here's a target. So the knight is uh, dominating the bishop, but here now white starts working against b5. I think he, this was bishop b4 is a bit more accurate at this stage, but uh, he plays some very subtle ideas here. Rook d5. He loves the centralized rooks, too. And, of course, the rook penetrates. Uh, um, pressures b5. Now here black should have played queen c6. Kind of pinning the rook. And then we might get queen f3, knight b6, rook d8 check, king g7. Now I think Yusupov feared this move. Rook d8 check. If bishop takes, he gets mated. If rook takes, he loses the queen. But king g7 is playable. Um, for black. I think with correct play should hold that. So instead of queen c6, he played rook a8, and this was the ultimately the losing move. Very tempting move, of course, coming, planning to go down and pin the bishop on e1. And of course, bishop b4 doesn't solve, it's, white's got back rank problems. Watch how Korchnoi handles this. King f1. And Yusupov could not resist the urge to pin that bishop. The king comes out. And now black finds his rook is... Uh, actually, it's, it's pretty well positioned for attacking play, but not for defensive play. The real action now is around black's king, as we soon learn. He improves his king. Here comes the bishop. Now black is faced with, well, rook takes b5 is in the mix now, not to mention queen e8. So he tries to play some defense. This, They're both in, in serious time pressure here. Huge crowd around the board. This is Lone Pine on the, uh, this is near the eastern side of the east, uh, Sierra Nevada mountains. Famous movie town. I mean, that's where they made all these westerns in the old days. A very idyllic site. So here, Yusupov, uh, I'm sure in time pressure, I know, in fact, I know they were both in time pressure here. Uh, he should have played queen b8, but uh, white nabs a pretty good pawn here. I think that's black's hard-pressed after that, even though it's all, all the pawns are on one side of the board, white's got better-looking pieces. Good chances to convert, but instead, because that was the best try, Instead, he played knight b6, and now after rook d6, exclamation point, uh, black is uh, doomed. Knight's really out of play now. The real target is that bishop on f6. And now the game ends very efficiently. Rook takes f6. Now the king is uh, has to come out. If queen e5, bishop e7, check wins. King f5, mate. So the king has to run, and bishops are just deadly in this type of position. 
course, knight ends it up nicely with bishop e7 check and check. And here, black resigned in view of king h5, g4 check, king h4, g5 check, takes and mate. Great game by Korchnoi, the game that lifted the USSR blockade of Victor Korchnoi. Oh, now here's another great game by, I hate to pick on Yusupov here, but uh, here's, here he's a victim of another beautiful game by Korchnoi. Very instructive, and we'll wind up the show with this one. So here we can see this is uh, after Mount Room move 25 or so. So black has a bad position. Knight, his minor pieces on the queen side are abysmal. His pawn at c6 is weak. White has attacking chances ev quite evidently against the black king. The queen on a5 is misplaced. All in all, pretty bad position, but still you have to put it away. The d4 pawn's a bit wet, weak, and so white has to keep the cap on that bottle. So let's watch how Korchnoi finishes this game up. Okay, black now defends his weakness. Here comes h4. That says not just a, that's just has an offensive purpose behind that move. He knows that g6 is going to come sooner or later, and he wants to have h5 coming down on black if and when black plays g6. If he plays h6, then black has a permanent uh, back rank problem. White will play h5 or bishop e4 ultimately, and black's king has eternal problems with his back rank, and that's, that's deadly. So he tries now. He brings the queen back to safety. Use of a very good, calm, tough, defensive player. And there's Korchnoi that he's already envisioning utilizing the H file. Excellent move. And now H5 doesn't let Black dream about playing H7, H5, driving away the queen. And Yusupov tries his best to hold on. Check. Okay, king comes back, but now the queen's misplaced. So he centralizes the bishop, which aims at g6, aims at c6, and he prepares king g2. Trade anyone? No, thank you. He comes back to guard c6. That's not a very impressive looking formation over on the queen's side. That's really black's main problem. Lift the king, setting up for rook h1. And there it is. Long planned, coming up. Rook h1. And now black could hold on, was try to hold on with something like bishop f8. But, it, oh, that's, he's in a positionally lost situation. He tried rook takes d4. And this is a move I am, I, Karchno, I had long, long foreseen this type of move with his vast experience. Rook h8 check. Queen takes f7. If you look in the court, and by the way, Yusupov has done the same the same type of tactic many, many times himself, several times. I think it's even appeared on attack with Larry C more than once. So this, of course, sets up rook h1 check. Black has to interfere with that. And so he returns his material, but now all of his pieces are sitting ducks all in a row and after queen takes e5 last bit last bit last bit of hope of course bishop takes g6 would allow c5 check and some some hope for black of course we instead plays queen e8 check planning to take on e7 with check so here facing ruinous material loss yusupov resigned Many other great games. In fact, I think I will definitely bring some more brilliant Korchnoi games uh, to a future show. Um, just a huge, something like 4,400, 4,500 known Korchnoi games in the database, probably more. Um, such a long career. So it's passing of one of the all time greats with Victor Korchnoi dying at age 85 in Switzerland. And uh, that'll do it for this episode of Attack with Larry C. We'll, I'm, I'll be bringing the long-awaited attacking handbook uh, next week. That's the plan now.
So thanks everyone for joining me.